Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America. This episode is brought to you by our friends at the University of Tennessee at Martin. UT Martin offers more than 100 academic areas of study within 18 undergraduate degree programs. Contact UT Martin today to find a program that's right for you. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Um, Emma, before I introduce our very special guest today, what is something you've discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? Well, this week I discovered that the UH-34 helicopter on display in the military gallery has been painted with the same markings as the helicopter that pulled astronaut Alan Shepard from the Atlantic Ocean after his historic flight. That is an incredible um, fact about a very uh, prominent um, artifact at Discovery Park that kids climb into and get to play with. Something that, something, I don't know if we've published it anywhere, but I've always found interesting that when um, Mr. Wade showed up to look at that artifact to see if Mr. Kirkland might want it, it was covered in Christmas lights. Oh, I had not heard that. (laughs) Maybe we should decorate it for uh, Christmas every year. For Christmas, fun. So our very special guest today is April Lieberman. Um, April, welcome. Thank you, Scott. It's great to be with you guys. Tell me a little bit about. Um, um, we're going to talk because you're the you're the um, grand uh, poopa of Rotary uh, right now for our for our area. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. But, but first of okay. all, I want to know more about you. Like, where did you grow up? Um, what were some of your influences? So let's start with your childhood. Where did you grow up? Ooh, I grew up in Gleason, right down the road in Gleason, Tennessee. It's in Weekly County, a little bitty town, about 1,200 people on a good day. And it's a sweet potato capital of the world. So, I, you know, I, I don't want to intimidate y'all, but I was Junior Miss Tater 1983. So it was very, very <laughs> exciting place to grow up. And uh, I was a basketball player and along with my sisters. I'm the only sister without a state tournament ring, championship ring, unfortunately. But I taught them everything I knew. And uh, I, after leaving Gleason, I uh, played basketball at Austin P. State University. Uh, what did, you, what did I, your uh, parents do? Were your parents farmers or what, what were they doing there? Well, my my grandfather, my grandparents were farmers. My granddaddy um, was named Possum Hicks, and he was actually the first farmer in West Tennessee back in the 1960s uh, to do no-till farming. And he was the first to plant soybeans as a crop in West Tennessee. He was an innovator uh, on his own. He um, had served in World War II and used his GI Bill to study through um, the Extension Agency out of UT Knoxville. Uh, to learn new farming techniques. And so he brought that technology and and know-how to West Tennessee. So I'm super proud to be from a long line of farmers. Um, My mother was their only child. And uh, granddaddy told her after she graduated from Gleason High School in 1966, big girl, I want you to go on over to Martin and go to that school down there at Martin. She's like, what do you mean? I'm going to go to college? He said, that's right. (laughs) You're going to go to college. And uh, he, he saw a lot of good things for her future and later told her to get her PhD. She got, majored in English. She became an English teacher. She got her doctorate from Ole Miss when I was a little girl. And she was actually my English teacher all through high school. Imagine your mother chaperoning the prom. So, uh, yeah, that had its downsides. But she was a phenomenal a teacher. She also taught my sisters and everyone else that went through Gleason High School in the 1980s and 90s. Wow, so that's she's a reti- she's, Yeah, she's a retired teacher, but um, I, I felt very fortunate. She, um, she taught me to write, and that skill took me far. Um, I was a, a reader. My, another influence of mine was my grandmother, my grandmother, Virginia Fay Hicks. I lived with her when I was in junior high school out on the farm north of Gleason. And um, when my grandfather passed, unfortunately, um, you know, my grandmother was really struggling financially. Uh, She didn't have the chance growing up in the depression to go to high school. Neither did my grandfather. 
uh, they just went to a, a little one room schoolhouse out in the country at Shady Grove School. And but she she was a reader. And w- when she took a job working over at World Color Books, it was a factory outside of Dresden, a book factory. It was used to be Hall's Printing Company. Um, she took a, a job working second shift. Uh, so I would come home from school. I was completely by myself out there, <laughs> just lonely out on the farm. So I, I, I read books. I was a reader and she would bring me home these misprinted books out of the garbage can from the factory. And I would read these books and through reading, I got to travel the whole world. And even though I was growing up in this little bitty town, I had this vision of that there was a whole world out there and I wanted to go out and see it. So that was, that was another inspiration of mine was my grandmother. So when it, when it, um, became time for you to figure out what you wanted to do after high school. Um, uh, where, did you know instantly or did you, what, what led you to what you ended up in? I thought for a minute about going into broadcast journalism. I was very interested in that. And I, I started majoring at that at Austin P. Uh, but they did not have the broadcast journalism major, they had a mass communication major, which was more of the technical stuff behind the scenes. So I, I kind of transitioned. I, I really didn't know what I was going to do. And my mother said, well, until you figure it out, you're going to major in business. And I'm like, but I, that's, I have no interest at all. Uh, but I majored in marketing for a year at Austin P. And I was really kind of struggling with what to do. And I'd always thought about law school. So um, I took time off from school. Actually, I got a modeling contract with Elite um, Model Management, and I moved to the models apartment in Atlanta, and that was in 1989. And that, in addition to being just a really interesting opportunity, um, I got to, I loved working with photographers and the stylists, and and you know I was making good money, but I I really hated answering the question, "What do you do?" I hated saying I'm a model because people would just assume that you were, you know, a, you know, a nitwit. So um, I remember I had gotten this little extra job of waitressing, and I was serving um, this this one table of gentlemen, and they said, "So, you know, what do you do?" And I told them I was a model, and they started laughing. And well, you can't be a model forever. What are you going to do when you're through modeling? And I said, well, I'm thinking about going to law school. And they just thought that was hilarious. And I, I, you know, I just kind of um, bit my tongue and was very, very polite. And then they said, um, they thought it'd be a joke to ask where I wanted to go to law school. And I said, well, either Yale or Harvard. I haven't decided yet. And they just, they were on the floor laughing. And that, I don't know, that afternoon, that really um, left a mark with me. And I decided, you know, I, I could spend my 20s making really good money, putting away money for law school, or I could just go and make it happen now. I could just go and find a way to put myself through school and, um, and figure it out. So I did that. I left um, modeling and I transferred into Vanderbilt University. I majored in philosophy and um, my professors, they said, you, we really want you to apply for Yale Law School, which it, it had, I, I, I did. And they supported me and wrote read letters of recommendation. And I got in. I was the only person from Tennessee that year that was admitted into my class at Yale. I mean, that's and a pretty I, high, that's a pretty high, um, that's a pretty high, first of all, just getting into law school is pretty, a pretty tough <laughs> uh, bar to try to try to jump over. Um what what made you feel like you could do it? I, I believed in myself. I, I really did. Um, and I wanted to challenge myself. And I, I never let uh, coming from a smaller school, uh, you know, a more country background get in my way. Um, my mother is really strong. She's uh, She was a single mom. She raised my myself, my three daughters, my two sisters uh, on her own. And uh, she, she always made it happen. And I mean, sometimes we struggled. I mean, we didn't have a lot of money. She was a teacher. She earned nothing. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. um, so, th- so the times were hard, but she, she persevered. And my sisters and I learned from her example. So I, I never doubted 
that I could go out and do these things. And I was blessed to be really, you know, a talented student. So I I went for it. And my professors at Vanderbilt really encouraged me. Um, They they gave me the confidence. They taught me critical writing and thinking skills. And um, I, you know, they set me on this whole new path that I don't know if I would have ended up on that path without their guidance. So I'm forever grateful to my time at, at Vanderbilt. So how how um, how was it when you uh, landed at Yale? Um, <laughs> you're the only Tennessean, yeah. uh, you know. There, you know, what what role did your rural background play uh, <laughs> in your in your Yale years? <laughs> I remember um, my very first day there. I went to the York York Diner, uh, right right next to the school, Yorkside Diner. And I ordered myself a burger and some sweet tea. And I didn't think anything about it. And the waitress just kind of looked at me. She said, well, honey, where are you from? (laughs) (laughs) Mocking my accent. I didn't realize how strong my accent was. But um, it's interesting. Another West Tennessean who was a year ahead of me was Van Jones. You you may see him on CNN as a political commentator. Um, But Van, you know, a lot of people don't know he grew up in Jackson. And he uh, was a communications major uh, right over here at Martin. And he had seen that I was coming in from his neck of the woods and sought me out and and gave me some guidance. And I remember he gave me this advice. Um, He laughed about my accent and he said, you know what? In a few weeks, you're going to lose that. (laughs) And he said, you're going to find out really soon that if you talk up here with your native accent, people will be distracted by it. And they're going to listen to how you talk instead of what you say. So I learned to, to communicate in, in that field. You know, I learned to, to speak in a way that would not distract a potential juror or a judge by the way I talk. And, but my, my roommates would just laugh hysterically because the second I picked up the phone to talk with my grandmother or my mom calling from Tennessee, I instantly reverted back to my accent. So they immediately knew I was on the phone with my family. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) Yeah. Um, You know, my, I, I too come from a rural family who I dearly love and Mm -hmm. as, as, as Southern as I sound now, you know, after I've been around them for just a little while, my wife will say, listen to yourself. You sound like a whole different person. It's funny how it just like really comes back up. Um, yeah, it does. So, um, so you, uh, did well at Yale and, um, followed that up with a really fascinating career in law. Why don't you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, when I graduated from law school in 1994, Uh, There were about 170 of us in that class. And amongst uh, my classmates was my future husband and now past husband. (laughs) Matt was um, one of my classmates and he was actually from New Haven. He had grown up in New Haven. Um, His dad uh, was Joe Lieberman. And so Matt and I started dating and uh, one thing led to another and we, we ended up settling in New Haven. I had not had any notion of staying and and living in Connecticut after law school. I thought I was going to go out to San Francisco. Honestly, I I thought I was going to um, go with my friends out West. Um, I had looked at at maybe a firm in in Nashville and different DC. I worked in DC one summer and I I loved this firm out, out in San Francisco. I loved that area. It was beautiful. So my plans changed and I ended up living in New Haven a total of 13 years. And some of those years, um, I was practicing law at a a midsize uh, Connecticut firm and doing litigation. And I actually had the chance to go into court quite a bit because I was in their New Haven office for this Hartford firm. So whenever a partner had something, you know, somebody needed to appear in court down on the coastline, they would send me. So I, even as a new associate, I got a lot of great opportunities and enjoyed the practice of law. What I wanted to do was kind of follow in the judge's uh, footsteps. The judge I clerked for was Rosemary Barquette. Now, she was on the uh, 11th Circuit Court of Appeals down in Miami, and I was a federal law clerk for her one year after law school. I loved that job. I learned so much from Judge Barquette, and uh, she taught me about right. She was a ruthless editor. 
and it taught me even more about writing. And I thought, you know, someday, if I were lucky, that um, my career, I would love to be a, an appellate court judge, whether on a state Supreme Court or in the Federal Court of Appeals like she was. But that was my goal for sure. Um, and then um, you uh, ended up um, at some point heading back this direction um, mm -hmm. where we mm -hmm. get to benefit from all of your experience <laughs> here in our region. Um, how did you land back in Tennessee? Well, um, when I was 30 years old, I was practicing law in New Haven. And one day I was leading a group of attorneys to lunch and the elevator door malfunctioned and I suffered a traumatic brain injury. So that was the end of my legal career and all of those hopes and dreams of becoming a judge someday and everything else I'd worked for. So I, I didn't know what to do with myself. I mean, in an instant, my whole career and, and trajectory was just over. And in a sense, you know, my identity was gone because in our culture, you know, what you do is often who you are. That's how you're perceived. So I, I really withdrew from the world. Um, it was a difficult recovery. It was about seven years after that injury, which was 1999. It was about seven years before I could walk without a cane and before my my speech cadence started to return before my old friend said, you know, you're really starting to sound like yourself again. So um, that was, it was a brutal, brutal um, recovery. Uh, I lost my marriage and in addition to my career and I found myself on my own. And uh, I just, I focused on my daughters, you know, who were school age and were trying, um, you know, I would just, do their carpool and take them to their ball games and play practices and whatever else they had going on. But I really wasn't a part of things. I really, I didn't even date. I was just by myself and my girls were my focus. So um, about eight years ago, I had the opportunity to come back home to West Tennessee. I'm like, you know what? I just want to go home and be where people love me and be around things that were familiar. And I was just very, you know, you take the girl out of West Tennessee, but you can't take West Tennessee out of the girl. I and mean, to the, I, point, yeah. where, to the yeah. point where one of your daughters is even named Tennessee, right? Yes, yes. My older daughter is actually named Tennessee May. And when I was working on um, my family tree as a project in high school, history project when my grandma and I would always work on it together and it's we would go out to old graveyards and do etchings and one time we went to Nashville and studied in the, the archives to get information so it was a continuation of a love that my grandma and I had shared and I had found that we had all these women in our family back in the 1800s that who were named Tennessee from a branch of the family that would move west like to Arkansas or Texas then they would name a daughter Tennessee after home. So when I married, and, and I'm a seventh generation Tennessean, and I was the first in my line to leave the state, I thought, you know what, I can name a daughter after home too. So um, I had Tennessee May, and my, my younger daughter is after my great grandma, who was Willie Beatrice. So I named her Willie D. And the D stands for my granddaddy. His given name was Doyle. He didn't like Doyle, and he didn't like possum either. He hated being called that. <laughs> so when he, when he lived in Michigan uh, in the Depression, he told people his name was Bill. But anyway, so I got Willie D and Tennessee May and two girls well, I, with very I'm southern sure, names. <laughs> I'm sure Willie D is very grateful to you that her name is not Possum. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. She's she's uh, actually a student um, at Emory University. She's uh, studying European history um, and with a focus on British history. And that was a love of an interest of my grandmother's, who was a great reader and loved reading about the, the monarchy and the history of England. Um, my older daughter, Tennessee, is studying at Tel Aviv University. So she's in Israel and riding out the pandemic over there. So I haven't gotten to see her in a, a, about a year and a half, but I'm oh. super proud for them to be following their dreams as a parent, that's really the best you can hope for is that your children, you've given them the tools and the confidence to go out and, and make it happen. 
Yeah, that's fantastic. When we get back, I'm going to ask you a little bit about what you're doing now. We're going to talk about Rotary, which is how we've connected. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll find out a little bit more about the present. Hundreds of students experience real-world learning at UT Martin. Faculty members pair students with the perfect internship, clinical, or educational placement that best suits their area of study. Visit utm.edu to learn more about UT Martin. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or your podcast catcher of choice. Our guest today is April, who is the queen of West Tennessee Rotary. Um, we're <laughs> going we're gonna to talk a little bit about that. Um, before we jump over to Rotary, April, tell, tell us a little bit about what you're doing now. Um, well, I'm a retired attorney, as you know, so I, I really spend a lot of my time uh, volunteering. And, uh, you know, I, when I moved home um, eight years ago, one of the first things I was asked uh, was to come to a Rotary meeting. And I knew about Jason Rotary growing up. I knew that they built the, um, the ballpark I grew up playing softball in, and they sponsored all of us children in, in town to have free swimming lessons over at Bethel University. So I was familiar with Rotary from, from that. Um, so I was invited over, and I really loved it. It's a little bitty club. The Gleason Rotary Club is very about 15 members. I mean, you're a member of the Union City Club, so you guys have you know quite a, a larger membership. But this was one of our small clubs. And uh, everybody had been in club president probably a few times <laughs> at that point. So I was fresh meat. And they informed me a few months after I joined, um, Mr. Joe Stewart told me that I was going to be president-elect. And I'm like, but I don't know anything about running a rotary meeting or being a Rotarian. And he said, well, we're going to send you to Mid-South Pets. That's the president-elect training. And they'll tell you everything you need to know. So I went, and this was in uh, spring of 2014. And I, I called my mother from Nashville and I said, Mama, <laughs> I have found my people. They are Rotarians. I love this. I, you know, when I showed up there, I didn't even know the Rotary's 30 plus year history working around the world eradicating polio. We're the major organization that led that charge and, and, and partnered with the World Health Organization and the CDC and, and um, the Bill Gates Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So, I mean, Rotary is making it happen. Um, I, I was just blown away, blown away by it. It, it. So inspiring. So I came back and had my year as club president and um, I was invited to do Rotary Leadership Institute uh, to learn more about Rotary beyond the club level. Uh, I did Rotary grad school where I got to study with past district governors. And a, a few years ago, I was asked to put my name in for district governor. Our district covers middle and West Tennessee. And uh, I'm like, but I'm too new. You know, I haven't been in Rotary long enough to be a, a district governor. And my friend said, you know, you're passionate, you're knowledgeable, and, you know, anything you don't know, you're going to pick up along the way. You've got three years to prepare once you start on this journey and they will train you. And, um, you know, he, he said, I think you have a lot to offer and I believe in you. And that touched me. It really touched me. Um, I hadn't heard that in a very long time. And I loved the feeling of being able to collaborate with people I respected and doing good things in the world. And, you know, working, whether it's local projects or we have Rotary projects and grants that are in over 200 countries worldwide. We are 1.2 million people. Um, plus, we have another 400,000 Rotaractors, uh, young, ro- younger Rotarians in their 20s who are doing remarkable things in their communities. So I found this inspiring um, and it tapped into some of my skills and my passions. And it's just something I I love putting my time into working with the people in this organization and meeting amazing people like you and and so many friends I've been able to meet. Um, I I got selected uh, to be district governor and we could not have known 
when we, a year ago, just a year ago, I was at international assembly um, with 535 other district governors from all around the world. And we got to meet our president, our RI president, Holger Kanak from Germany. And he told us that our theme this year was going to be Rotary Opens Opportunities. And we couldn't have understood the year we were stepping into with a pandemic coming just weeks after that big event and how it would, how it would alter how uh, not, not only how we rotary, but how, how business is done, how we do government. There's so many things that have been impacted in just a small time frame. Um, you know, we've had to be uh, d- adaptable. We've had to be innovative and, and sort of just think on our feet and, and continue to find new ways to keep people connected. And one of those is, is what we're doing right now is Zoom. Um, I had never heard of Zoom <laughs> a year ago, but I've learned awfully fast. And, and so that's how I had to do my district governor visits. Normally I would have been driving tens of thousands of miles all fall from Rotary Club to Rotary Club. And I think probably the RI board, when they told us that we're not gonna be doing that this year, um, understood that we didn't need to be typhoid Marys taking contagion with us and <laughs> infecting club after club. Um, you know, so we've, we've had to be uh, adaptable and I'm, I'm beyond proud of this class of club presidents. Um, you know, I have 60 club presidents. We lost, they lost their Mid-South pets to learn all about being a district governor, the experience that was so formative for me. And that I really, that was a highlight I was looking forward to was being able to recreate that experience for a new generation of club leaders. So we didn't get to do that. We had to adapt and, and have webinars and, and other ways of, um, of getting ready for our year. But they, they are beyond uh having a successful year. I am so proud of everything they're doing to keep people engaged and connected and to continue finding new ways to serve the community. You know, they've lost their fundraisers, you know, the typical fundraisers that they would be having. Well, we're not having big events right now, right? So they've they've found ways to take take events outside and socially distance and have drive-through events and I I love the creativity and I love the passion and it makes me just that much prouder to be a part of this organization. Well, I know like the vision statement for Rotary, for anybody who doesn't know anything at all, the vision statement for Rotary, I thought was really impactful. It's together, we see a world where people unite and take action to create lasting change across the globe, in our communities, and in ourselves. And the pandemic nipped a big chunk of that where people unite and take action. And so um, I also, you know, as a West Tennessee Rotarian um, was uh, privy to all your initial communication, the announcement of your new leadership and the communication that you sent out, which I appreciated. Um, And then of course I I was looking forward to, you know, rotaring under your leadership. And then of course the (laughs) pandemic Um, the last thing I had to think about in the middle, you know, as it first, you know, started was rotary. I'm so focused on just trying to keep all of our wars in the water, you know, figuring out ways we can all communicate. Um, and so, um, not too long ago, I ran across an email, an early email from you when I was looking, you know, to do this. And I thought, oh my gosh, Mm -hmm. you know, how disappointing, you know, that, that, you know, all these great things she had planned, but at the same time, it's been awesome to see how you've responded to the emergency and, and the change. Um, how do you think rotary Rotary across the nation uh, will be different going forward because of what we've all gone through together in the pandemic? I think one thing that we know better than we ever knew before is the value of connection. You know, when people are are quarantined or, you know, socially distancing, staying at home, I mean, I really miss that human connection. And yes, I had never heard of Zoom <laughs> a year ago. I'm not from the corporate world. So uh, that, that wasn't in my, my uh, tool bag, but I am so grateful that to have that we do have this technology, um, despite the restrictions that we're living under right now, we can still uh, fellowship as clubs. We can still come together and have meetings, even though it is virtual. Uh, I'm really grateful that we have this, and I think it's going to make us a leaner, smarter organization. 
I think we're going to be more technically proficient. I think we're going to be more efficient. I think we are going to uh, be more accessible. Uh, I think uh, what has been a surprise for some clubs is that with the advent of Zoom meetings or hybrid meetings, they're getting people back involved in Rotary who, for one reason or another, could not attend in-person meetings, maybe some that are a little older and can't get out quite as much anymore, or other people who travel as part of their business, or, you know, someone with a sick family member at home. It opens up more opportunities. And that's our theme, right? Rotary opens opportunities. So I love that we're learning from this and turning this into a positive. And I think um, instead of wasting money coming together for planning meetings and sessions, I, I see those going the wayside. And I see us, you know, it, it, it forced us to modernize and come into the 21st century and get with it. And I, I think we're going to be um, probably better stewards and more efficient and, uh, with our time and, and resources. Now, you know, um, Robert Kirkland was a huge uh, champion mm. of Rotary. And yes. so I am blessed to get to share the Discovery Park of America story with Rotaries all over uh, the region. And it's been fun um, getting to, they do it two different ways. Either I'm on a Zoom with about 30 other people and they're all in their bedrooms or their offices or their <laughs> yeah. kitchens. And so I'm, I'm able to share with them that way. Or in some cases, they project my, my mug onto a big screen <laughs> where they're in a room, you know, Together, spaced yeah. apart, you know. So um, it, it has been interesting getting to experience all the different ways um, that we're continuing to stay together. Um, mm -hmm. you're, you've grown up around rural communities and yet you've lived, you know, in certainly in urban settings. Um, yeah. it, it's interesting to me, like in now living in a rural community, the fact that there are rotaries and lion clubs and, you know, uh, women of the worlds. And, and what, do you, what, what is the role of organizations like this uh, specifically for rural communities, in your opinion? It's incredibly important. Uh, it's it's it takes um, the place. Uh, there used to be farm barn raisings and quilting bees. You know, in my great our great grandparents' generations, the community would come together when there was a need. People would come together and make it happen. Uh, if there was a family that was hit by a tragedy, people would come together. And I see service organizations performing much that same role today. You know, we're the go-to, like, and I'm, I'm a member of the Dresden Rotary Club right now. It's, it's you know, it's a go-to organization here. Uh, when, when there are students at the school who cannot afford a graduation cap and gown, uh, we step in. Uh, if they can't afford the books for an online class, we will step in. When, when there are um, groups or families need, we step in. And that is the role I see Rotary playing in all of our communities across Middle and West Tennessee and, and, and across the country and the world. Um, we're grassroots service. We, we know best our communities and, and the needs in our communities. So I, I love that about our organization. It's not a top-down organization. It's a, it's a grassroots organization of local community leaders. Um, I, I see that as uh, an incredibly important role, especially, you know, as it seems like we people get isolated with the internet and all of the technical advances that we have in this day and age. It's, it's kind of old fashioned, but it's, but we need that, you know, it, it's successful for a reason, those connections and the friendships we make, you may join, um, people join to network. And, and, you know, to build their businesses, that's an important reason the Rotary was founded. But you end up staying because of the relationships and the friendships and the service. You know, it feels good to help someone else. When, you're, when you are carrying something on your shoulders, there is nothing like being able to set that aside and focus on the needs of others. That is healing. That is, is, it nourishes your soul. And, um, you know, for someone that didn't have that for a long time, you know, I really, you know, I was kind of a hermit, you know, I, I didn't go out and take part in things. I am beyond grateful to have this opportunity to connect with people again. 
you know, I joined because I wanted to find a way to give back to my my hometown that had given me so much going off out into the world. What I didn't understand when I joined was how much it was going to help me, how healing that would be to me. And, and in so many ways, through these projects and programs and the relationships I've built, I've recovered parts of me from long ago. And you know, I, in a way, my daughters, I, they look at me anew because this is not the mother they knew growing up. And I'm, I'm vibrant again. I'm happy again. I'm, in, I'm involved. I'm, I'm doing good works and it makes me feel good about the world. It's changed me for the better. And they, they see that, you know, so I, you know, I, I can't, I can't if, if, if you've never been to a rotary meeting, <laughs> when, when we get through this pandemic, find yourself a rotary meeting. And a lot of them are meeting right now online. They're, they're meeting by Zoom and, you know, look on Facebook. Um, if, you know, you can contact me or Scott, if you want to find a rotary club near you, I can help you out um, to, to get you connected. Um, rotary.org visit rotary.org and you can find a rotary club near you and, and learn more about this amazing organization. We're rated as one of the top charities in the world for the past 13 years straight. Like we're the, have the highest rating for how we are good stewards of, of the monies that are given for global projects and local projects. So if you want to be, make a difference in the world, if you want to be that change that you want the world to be, I can't think of no better way than than becoming a Rotarian. And you can affect your community and you can change the world. And what what more could you ask? Absolutely. And, you know, I, I worry, you know, about clubs like Rotary and other clubs that I'm a member of where we gather together. I worry about millennials and folks who are so used to uh, – a different style of communication. Mm -hmm. And I have right. seen numbers decline in some of these clubs that I'm a member of because younger people, younger executives um, have not been necessarily engaging that way. I've completely changed my thinking now. What I, th what I predict is going to happen, we'll see if it does or not. But I think that through this pandemic, so many young executives and so many young people, their only communication has been now digital, that getting together in person is going to be such a energizer and such a breath yeah. of fresh air that I think yeah. all these clubs are going to see people grow. Um, it's almost like explaining Rotary is like TikTok, but in person. You know, <laughs> you get to go and you get to encounter all types of people. There's speakers, you know, and I really think that we're going to see a boom in clubs like Rotary and in in-person participation, because you're right, we are, we are losing that sense of community through this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I think clubs like Rotary have a great opportunity um, to give that back. I, I absolutely agree with you. And, and I see Rotary growing as well in terms of um, taking into account the needs of younger people, you know, younger uh, professionals, they don't necessarily have the time in the middle of the workday to leave and go to a rotary meeting every week or a breakfast meeting when they're trying to get their kids off to school. So what we have found to be really successful, and I think, and I've, as I've done my talks with different clubs through the year, I'm encouraging them to either consider this as uh, an alternative format or to sponsor satellite clubs with the concept of a, a, a happy hour club that meets twice a month, you know, and off hours after people get off of work. And we, we have one club that's been remarkably successful with this model, and it's the Downtown Franklin Club. And they have grown by leaps and bounds over the past three years and have been club of the year. They're now up to around 150 members. And they have a lot of couples, like empty nester couples, that join Rotary as a couple. And Rotary becomes date night. It's a lot of fun. They have some beverages. Uh, there's, it's a lower uh, cost structure because you're not paying for the cost of a meal. So that's more affordable for younger people. And uh, you're not having the weekly meetings. You can meet every other week. That's perfectly fine. And they really focus on their service projects. So instead of uh, 
presenting speakers at you know every meeting, they may have a discussion about what pop-up project that they want to have an impact in the community. You know, we're going to go clean up the Harpeth River or, or whatever uh, that project may be. So I, I see that as a future where you're making it more millennial friendly and it's a lot of fun and you're still getting to, to have that good feeling of doing good rotary works, but it becomes... Rotary becomes date night, <laughs> you know. I, I, they, are, they are very successful with it, and I really think that we are right for having more clubs along that format. No, I, I completely agree, and I've spoken at some rotaries in towns where once the same community will have a lunch rotary and a um, afternoon ro- evening rotary because mm-hmm. some people would rather go at night, some people would rather go in the middle of the day. Um, yeah. I think flexibility um, is the answer there, but I do think, you know, I think when the, when the, um, when we get, when we turn the page finally on this chapter, it is, there is going to be a whole new business world that, that we all can adapt to and and take advantage of. I think the world is going to be a much, much better place for us to do good works in. I absolutely agree. Um, We, we're, we're going to be, we're going to be a smarter organization and I think people are going to be hungry. For, for what we offer in terms of service and, and fellowship and connection. I agree. Uh, before we go, I always like to ask everybody, what is one thing that you've discovered since we're Discovery Park of America? What's one thing that you've discovered that you think has contributed in a positive way in your life? Oh, my goodness. I, 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 I mean, we've been talking about it, but I know that the biggest factor has been joining Rotary it changed my life. It, is, it has changed my life several times when I first joined and I regained the sense of connection. And then again, when I was uh, asked to, be, to get into a leadership role and it is I, I've, the people I have met and the horizons it has opened for me and the connections I've made are just, I know that these are lifelong friendships and it absolutely changed my life. And and now when people ask me, so April, you know, what do you do? I say, I do rotary. <laughs> <laughs> I do it. I do it full time. It is my jam. These are my people. And I love it. I love every minute of it. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoy this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.